What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History. This is chapter 21, Reaching Out, Expanding Horizons of Cross-Cultural Interaction. So first up, we have the big ideas. This is an intermission chapter. It has a few uh, things that I like to call like the weirdos. Here's why they're a little weird. Uh, throughout most of our book, we've kind of focused on regions or sections of the globe as history has progressed. But when we look at this chapter, one of the things that uh, really stands out is that these people that we're going to be talking about, uh, a few of them in here, really were the first groups that kind of traveled around, and we're going to really focus in on them and their cross-cultural interaction between uh, the places that they originally come from and their interaction either from the west to the east or the east to the west, and even we're going to see some reaching out from the European islands into the larger scope of the world in terms of Africa the uh, Far East and Asia, and eventually to the Americas. That's the first time we're going to start seeing Europeans travel to the Americas. So to help uh, kind of simplify this, I've kind of made the individuals green, and I'm going to highlight that. There's one little exception we're going to look at later. There's the orange that are groups that kind of traveled around. There are changes throughout environmental and disease factors. These are going to be highlighted with red slides. Uh, this chapter is really important because it kind of highlights a very big moment in uh, European history with the uh, arrival of the bubonic plague from, plague from China. And we're also going to look at something called the Little Ice Age that kind of affected uh, most of Europe for about 500 years. Beginning with a huge change to world interactions, uh, we're going to see Columbus. Uh, as many of you know about Christopher Columbus, we're going to see him for the first time and see uh, some of his uh, travels and where he ends up by the end. We're going to see the beginning of the Renaissance in Europe and its uh, return to uh, Roman and Greek classic, the Greco-Roman uh, kind of way of looking at the world, and a reinstitution of Chinese rule to China. China's going to get rid of the Mongols. So first up, here's our overview. This chapter explores the cross-cultural networks that linked Europe and Asia between 1000 and 1500. The Mongol conquest of the 13th century disrupted commerce along the ancient Silk Route through the Central Asia, but eventually trade and travel were restored and even strengthened. Although travel was slow and costly, international trade grew significantly with the exchange of crops, technologies, and ideas. Ironically, that same traffic helped spread the bubonic plague, the Black Death, which ravaged much of Eurasia in the mid-14th century. Common elements of these cross-cultural networks include the following. Diplomacy. Different states used trade routes to send envoys abroad, seeking either to form alliances or to impress potential rivals. Religion. Islamic law and culture were common to societies from North and West Africa to Southeast Asia and the Philippines. Travel for Muslim pilgrims and scholars were common under Mongol rule. Christian missionaries also traveled to East Asia, but less frequently. Cultural diffusion. These routes became an important source of new ideas and information throughout Eurasia. New crops, such as sugarcane, and new technologies, such as gunpowder, the magnetic compass, and the printing press transformed Western societies. European exploration. Portugal sought to bypass Muslim-controlled trade routes by mounting expeditions to India around the Cape of Good Hope. In 1492, the Spanish attempted to beat the Portuguese at this game by sending Columbus west across the Atlantic. All right, so here's our first section. Uh, kind of a little bit of rewind. We're going to look at the patterns of long-distance trade. So we've talked about before the Silk Roads and how the Silk Road really was a giant uh, trade route that was part of our uh, understanding of how the Eastern Hemisphere really interacted with one another. Along the Silk Road, we had uh, Rome at its height, traveling or trading all the way as far as India, and goods that were in India eventually move on to China. And we had goods from China moving into Europe, all over the place. And this was facilitated through an overland route. We also have at the same time sea lanes of the Indian Ocean Basin. As uh, Eastern uh, Asian cultures moved their goods to India, India was able to move a lot of those goods within the Indian Ocean Basin and getting it uh, to Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and a little bit into the Mediterranean. We have the Trans-Saharan Caravan routes that we talked about, facilitated by the use of camels. Uh, this was done primarily uh, through the use of traders as they were able to really penetrate into the southern sections of Africa, moving through uh, what we would call today the Middle East. Some of uh, the things that you need to understand about this is that all three of these, by this point, have really become dominated by one centralized group, the Muslim uh, traders. For the Silk Roads, we have a number of Muslim uh, cultures and uh, like muslim empires springing up along the silk routes controlling uh the silk uh, road taxes and uh, tolls along the road uh, 
they weren't traditional like toll booths, but they were forced to pay taxes and pay different um, tributes as traders went along those routes. In the Indian Ocean Basin, we had many uh, Muslim uh, sailors in the Indian Ocean Basin. Uh, they were able to control and dominate that whole uh, trading network. And the Trans-Saharan caravan routes were almost exclusively uh, through the use of Bedouin or through uh, Muslim traders through that section of the globe. So we get the development of trading cities, which become main centers for trade, where people from all over the world really try to get their goods to those main trading cities. And then from there, those goods can go out and to continue along the journey to where their final destination would be. So for example, if you had something coming from Europe, it would move along a trade city until it eventually, or move along the trade routes until it got to a trade city where the goods would be unloaded there, the original uh, transporters of those goods would receive payment and then return home. Uh, then another set of traders would come along to that trade city, pick up the goods from a middleman, and then continue back to where they came from. This significantly reduced the amount of time that it would require to move goods across the world, and it allowed people to get payments much quicker. We are going to look at Emporia as well. Emporia are basically giant warehouses that were able to store and hold many goods from all over the world. They were usually in control, uh, controlled by traders in those trading cities, and especially prevalent in the area of India. Nomadic invasions cause local devastation, but expand the trade network. As nomads travel around, they're destroying a lot of cultures that are set up in different areas, but they expand the trade network because this new culture that's moving in is able to have established uh, relationships with their larger culture that they're coming from and are integrating the conquered areas into their trade networks, allowing for more trade. Example is the Mongols in China in the 13th century. So first up, we have our, our first weirdo, uh, Marco Polo in 1253 to 1324, he lived. He's an example of long distance travel. He traveled to China with his merchant father and uncle, and he enters the service of the Mongol Kublai Khan. He returns to Venice after a 17 year absence, and his experience was recorded by a fellow prisoner in a uh, time when he was captured during the Venice-Genoa conflict. While he's uh, captured, he begins to tell the stories about the time he went to China, and he met Kublai Khan, the Mongol emperor, and he had worked there for a while. Well, this prisoner who was with him eventually wrote very famous uh, poems and stories about the like exoticness and the the very fun and interesting parts and the, the strangeness that is China compared to Europe. And this is a great influence on European engagement with the Far East because in many of his stories, Marco Polo talks about like the silks and the jewels and the rice and the spices and all the goods that are all over in China. And for many people who read Marco Polo's stories, uh, they see an opportunity to make lots of money. So this kind of sparks a new, a renewed interest in trying to find out ways for Europeans to get their goods or to at least become traders on the Silk Road. Here are the travels of Marco Polo and eventually Ibn Battuta, we'll talk about in a sec. You can see uh, Marco Polo's in blue. You can see he traveled all around through from Venice, and then he went out into the Middle East, and then he moved south through uh, what is Arabia today, parts of no Northern Arabia. He moved eventually up through Asia. He went through Mongol territory. He eventually makes it all the way to the East China Sea. He then goes off into um, some of the Southeast Asian islands. He then travels on a boat home around the bottom of India and eventually crosses through um, back through like Persia and Baghdad, and then he goes through Constantinople, eventually making it back to Venice where he is arrested during the Venice-Genoa conflict. Now Marco Polo, uh, through his extensive travels, is not a rarity, but it was odd for the time. There were a number of other travelers who went along those routes, but many people didn't have the opportunity or option to write down their experience. And so Marco Polo becomes kind of a symbol of international travel and trade. And you can see in green the Mongol empires that he traveled through. Political and diplomatic travel. Trade requires diplomatic relations after 1000 CE. The Mongols, Christians, recognized Muslims as a common enemy in the 13th century. Trade uh, really is, is a good way to prevent war. If you are angry with somebody, you're not really in an opportunity to trade with them or have good relations with them, so you're more willing to have conflict. Uh, trade, however, forces people to sit down and have diplomats negotiate peace so that travelers and traders can continue to trade along trade routes and that people won't assault or hurt them. If you want to make money, you can't have the people bringing you stuff or bringing you your money get attacked or violently uh, accosted along the roads or the sea routes on the way to bringing you your stuff. 
So this trade requires that these diplomatic relations allow people to uh, move freely to facilitate trade. The Mongols and Christians get together and realize that uh, Muslims are a common enemy, not in the sense that uh, it's their religion, but in the sense of not f allowing for a, a good trade relation. Muslims in this example stick together very tightly as a trade network, and the Mongols and Christians were not unified as a trade network, but they see that the Muslims are dominating through this process and need to be able to unify. A funny story is Pope Innocent the Fourth invites the Mongols to convert to Christianity through this process. And when the Mongols receive uh, the offer from Pope Innocent, they send back a counteroffer saying Christians should accept Mongol rule or they will be destroyed. Kind of a very Mongol response. Diplomatic travelers are back to those weirdos. Robin Sauma, he's an Nestorian Christian priest from uh, the China, from China, uh, who was sent by the Mongols to to Persia in 1287 regarding a proposed attack on Jerusalem. The idea was, as an Nestorian Christian, he sees Jerusalem as the birthplace of Jesus, someone he admires greatly as a part of his religion. Uh, so he says, why don't I go to Europe and on behalf of the Mongol state, let us work on proposing to attack Jerusalem, to reconquer Jerusalem from the Muslims who have taken it over at this point. But many Europeans do not see supporting this process as being beneficial to uh, their ends. So in 1295, he's eventually in the uh, area of Persia, and the uh, new leader of Persia accepts Islam, and this shuts the door to any kind of future relationship between uh, the East and uh, Europe. Now we have our third diplomatic traveler, uh, Islamic scholar Ibn Battuta. He worked in governments on extensive travel. Uh, he set up strict punishments uh, according to Sharia law, which we've talked about in the past. Uh, it had lashes for drinking al alcohol. He was so radical that in one instance, he gave 80 lashes for a man who had drank alcohol over eight years previously. He also had hand amputations for thefts. Uh, Ibn Battuta believed that by strictly adhering to the uh, tenets of Sharia, he was promoting his understanding of Islam. And we had talked about in the past how not all Muslims in the world agree that this is a positive step in the right direction for Islam. Unable, however, to convince women of the Maldive Islands to cover their breasts, they wandered around pretty much half naked, and Ibn Battuta was uh, shamed by this process. So Ibn Battuta was a, an Islamic traveler, went all around the world. Missionary travelers. Now we're into this, like, groups. Uh, Sufi missionaries traveled throughout the new Muslim territories between uh, 10 or 1000 and 1500 CE. Christian missionaries accompany and follow crusaders. Uh, the crusade we'll talk about a little bit later. Roman Catholic priests travel east to serve expatriate communities. Expatriate just means people who are from a certain area that decide to live in another area of the globe. So if you live in America and you decide to go live in Spain, you are an American expatriate who lives in Spain. John of Monte Corvino travels to China in 1291. He becomes the uh, archbishop of China. During this time, he translates biblical texts into some of the earliest writings in uh, China for people to read. He builds churches. He baptizes young Mongol and Chinese children into the Christian faith. Uh, he's a very weird traveler that we need to add to the green section. He just ends up on this weird slide. Cultural exchanges. There were songs and stories that were put out through troubadours, a mixture of European uh, entertainers for courts. So it, when you think of like a jester or somebody singing in a court, a troubadour is somebody who has like a little kind of musical instrument and maybe makes songs. They would have promoted uh, the ideas of love and romance and fighting, but at the same time would have had a very specific kind of twist to it with some Muslim influence and some other cultural influences thrown in. European scientists consulted with Muslim and Jewish counterparts at this time, especially in the area of Spain in Cordova. And they're starting to look around and say, wow, there's a lot that we don't really understand about the world, but we're willing to put aside some of our religious uh, beliefs for the ability to kind of negotiate and talk about what kind of documents you have from some of the older scientists who had done some work, specifically the Greeks and the Romans. And we're willing to kind of go and trade uh, books and scrolls and whatever we have to try and figure out some new ideas about science. And they wanted to really work on understanding the natural world. You can understand where religious groups are really fascinated by this process because what they're trying to do is understand why in the natural world, if we believe as Muslims, Allah has created uh, the world, then maybe there's an order to the world because Allah is ordered. And if you're Jewish, you believe that Yahweh, uh, possibly the same, depending on who you ask, 
uh, has created the world, and maybe there's a natural order because Yahweh is perfect. And if Yahweh is perfect, he's created the world perfectly, and we can understand it. At the same time, we're starting to see some uh, inventions move from different areas of the globe to others, specifically a magnetic compass from China. You've played with a compass probably in the past. It's a little tiny arrow that sits on a little bit of water, and because it's magnetized, the poles of the Earth and the magnetic fields of the Earth pull it towards uh, north. So if you're trying to figure out which way you're going, you use a compass, and then you know which way north is, even without the sun or without any other uh, need for outside uh, influence. Spread of crops. Now, this is red because it's about uh, environmental and agricultural and disease. The spread of crops. Citrus fruits move around the globe, specifically from east to west. Asian rice moves from east to west. Cotton moves uh, throughout the world. And one of the biggest things that happens is sugar cane. Now, Europeans uh, are introduced to sugar cane by Muslims that are able to eventually crystallize sugar cane. For a number of reasons, Europeans weren't unable to really uh, embrace sugar from sugar cane as a part of their diet because of environmental factors, because of trade network restrictions, because sugar is kind of temperamental. If it gets wet, it's no good. And so by making crystallized sugar, the Muslims are able to move this farther uh, out from where they grow it, specifically in more warmer climates. And as Europeans start to taste something sweet, the demand increases rapidly. Up to this point, many Europeans were just using like honey to sweeten a lot of their foods. Europeans use Muslim precedent of having large populations of slaves work on sugarcane plantations to facilitate this process. Gunpowder technologies. Muslims and Mongols spread gunpowder technology from east to west, the technology eventually reaches Europe by the mid-13th century. We are now going to start to see a huge shift in warfare and how uh, people do battle as uh, gunpowder is able to build cannons and guns and explosives and yada yada. Crisis and recovery. The Little Ice Age. Somewhere around 1300 CE, the Earth decided that it was going to go through a dramatic climactic change, specifically throughout most of Europe. This decline, this led to a decline of agricultural output that leads to widespread famine. In some areas of the very farther, farthest north parts of Europe, Europeans were basically unable to grow anything because the entirety of uh, that section of the globe kind of cooled. And as a result of that cooling, even a few temperature degrees can cause huge uh, changes and, and, and shifts in the way that uh, agriculture is actually uh, grown. Uh, this leads to famine, which leads to people dying. And another thing that ends up happening is the bubonic plague spreads from southwest China, originally carried by fleas on rodents, and gets eventually to Europe. Now, we've talked about before that along trade networks and trade routes, it's not just goods that are moving, there are ideas that are moving, but now we're going to start talking about diseases that are moving. Uh, this is going to be a huge change uh, demographically to Europe because as uh, many Europeans had never encountered this disease before, they had no antibodies, no immunity to it, and because of a lack of strength from this famine, from the Little Ice Age, people weren't getting enough calories. Less calories means lower immune system. Lower immune system means more susceptible to diseases, and if you're more susceptible to diseases, you're more likely to die. Mongol campaigns also spread disease to the Chinese interior as they spread around uh, conquering more and more of China. Spread of the plague. Mongols, merchants, travelers spread the disease west. In 1346, there were Black Sea ports that had reports of receiving Black Plague. Uh, as a result, to as a desire to escape the disease, uh, many uh, traders and merchants and travelers moved from the Black Sea ports west into the Mediterranean Sea, taking the disease with them. Uh, from in the 1347, many Europeans, uh, especially in Mediterranean ports like Venice and Genoa and a few others along the uh, Italian peninsula, uh, shut off their ports, but they're, they're not really willing to shut down completely because they really want to continue making money. They've built their, uh, their whole economies in a lot of ways around trade, especially on the Italian peninsula. And so many of them just really work on different ways of, um, uh, preventing disease. For example, uh, quarantine uh, is has its roots in disease prevention. When you're in quarantine, what that means is you're locked away and no one's allowed to really interact with you or visit with you. So if we put you in quarantine, we'd probably lock you in a hospital, in a room, and no one would be allowed to go into that room because maybe you have a disease that's very highly uh, infectious or is able to spread really easily. This came from a time during when uh, Venice, when traders were 
uh, coming to Venice, they had to sit off in the port without actually docking with any of their goods for a number of days, uh, about 40 or a quarant, to allow the Venetians to see, okay, well, if you have the Black Death, well, the people on the boat will die, and then we just know to go set fire to that boat if all of you die from Black Death, and we won't get the disease. Doesn't always work, especially since by 1348 in Western Europe, it spread the plague out that way. Symptoms of the Black Plague, here's some fun stuff. Inflamed and discover, discolored lymph nodes in the neck, armpits, and groin area. If you kind of feel around your neck with your, with your fingers and you start to talk, you'll feel kind of a vibrating uh, thing. On, on most uh, people, there's kind of, that's kind of where your throat and your voice box is. But if you kind of go down a little bit more towards like your neck, like the bottom of your neck, right in the middle there, there's your thyroid. And around all those areas, there are little lymph nodes that if you kind of press hard, you can kind of feel little bumps. And if you're not too sick or you're not really uh, n under the weather, you really shouldn't feel them. But if you're sick, you, they sometimes fill with um, pus or infection. And if you ever have had it where like under your armpit hurts really bad, maybe from just like stretching or uh, you're not feeling well and it kind of feels sore, there's lymph nodes inside of your armpits, there's lymph nodes behind your knees, there's lymph nodes kind of in your groin areas, it's all over the place in your body. And those start to swell, and uh, when they swell, they're full of gross, nasty disease. They eventually are called bubos, which means uh, oil, like under the skin, and hence bubonic. Uh, it had a 60 to 70% death or mortality rate within the days of the onset of symptoms, uh, up at this time, many Europeans didn't really understand how diseases work, and that was the drive, really, for a lot of their scientific understanding of the natural world. Uh, even the most religious of scientists would have thought, man, there must be another reason, because it doesn't make any sense if we have uh, not just the peasants getting sick, but sometimes the priest or the, um, the cleric getting sick. And we can't understand why, if God is in control of diseases, why is it that people just keep getting these random diseases? Are they being bad people? Well, no, that's not really something we think and hmm maybe it's maybe it's something else and so they didn't really understand how it traveled and they didn't have a, a germ theory of disease yet to understand that germs or viruses even carry diseases uh extreme northern climates were less affected mostly because it's really hard for f the very small fleas that uh carry the disease the disease is in your blood so a flea would be on a rodent it would bite the rodent it would have a little bit of blood in its tummy or in its mouth, and then eventually it would, those rodents would, you know, jump off the rodent, or excuse me, the fleas would jump off the rodent, the fleas would then be in a field somewhere, you'd be walking through a field, it goes on your clothes, that night it bites you, some of the blood that was in the rodent with the disease inside of it goes into your blood, it's able to find a nice warm place to incubate in a very low immune system person because of a number of factors, and people start to die as a result of that. But in the winter areas of northern Europe, uh, it's really hard for fleas to live out in the very cold environments without like freezing to death or uh, really going and not having their populations grow. In India and sub-Saharan areas, they were unaffected. We're not sure. Don't know. Yeah. Population decline in millions. As you look at 1300 CE, you see that uh, in China, we have around 77 million people. And in Europe, around 75 million people. But by 1400, we've lost, we've lost a few million because of uh, disease and famine. Especially hit hard is Europe. As you can see, a huge, almost um, double-digit percentage decline in uh, this time period. We'll see a rebound as uh, the plague immunity kind of spreads and the little ice age ends. But we're going to see uh, a pretty big dip in Europe around 1400 CE for that whole 100-year uh, period. Social and economic effects, because of the disease, because of the lack of agriculture, there is economic uh, problems as a result of it. Massive labor shortage. If you were a peasant living in a field, the problem becomes that you maybe had 50 people in your village that maybe all had farms and you were doing the feudalism thing in Europe and paying your lord and they were protecting you and yada yada. But let's say half your village died. And if half your village died from disease and malnutrition, well, now there's half as much people working to make the same amount of food, and they're not going to make as much food, especially considering the little ice age. This leads to labor shortage, which uh, leads to having not just the low-end people like peasants, but also any kinds of tradesmen 
having lower populations requiring or having them see the ability to say, hey, we want higher wages. Imagine in the town you live in, you were the only person who knew how to weld, like weld metal together. If you lived in the middle of nowhere and your town had like a thousand people in it and someone wanted something welded, they would come to you because many people didn't have the ability to know how to do that. In this example, you could charge a very normal rate for your services, let's say $100, right? And people would pay you. But because you're the only one who knows how to do that thing or a very limited number of people know how to do that thing, you could actually charge outrageous amounts of money for that because if anyone wants that service to happen like welding, they have to come to you. Because of this labor shortage a lot across uh, trades, across a number of things in uh, Europe, people demand higher wages for those same services. Also at this time, because of a lack of uh, really control because of famine and uh, disease, people start to move. They're moving away from disease centers. They're moving away from famine centers. They're moving towards places where they think there's food. If you were in a place where nothing was growing because of the little ice age, and you heard about a town maybe 100 miles away, you might be willing to take you and your family to move to that area to be able to feed your family. Governments attempt to stop this by freezing wages, saying that they're not going to pay any tradesmen or any people who receive money for services or goods a certain amount of money, and they want to stop the serfs from moving because as serfs move away, that's even less people who are able to grow the foods for the area that they're originally from. Riots result as a, as a part of this because people are not very happy when you tell them they can't have the money they think they deserve, and they're also unhappy when you tell them they can't leave and they have to stay there. Recovery in China, the Ming Dynasty. The Yuan Dynasty collapses in 1368, and the Mongols actually leave China. Uh, impoverished or orphan raised by Buddhist monks works through military ranks and eventually becomes the Emperor Hongwu. He proclaims the new or uh, the Ming Dynasty, or the Brilliant in Chinese, from uh, 1368 to 1644. So it's going to be one of the larger uh, Chinese dynasties that we're going to be looking at. So the Mongols have left China. And now the Chinese are looking around going, hmm, what do we need to do to be able to reestablish uh, Chinese culture or Chinese influence after the Mongols kind of dominated most of China? Under that process, it's called Ming centralization. We've talked about before, when there is no strong centralized power, regional states pop up. But now that the Mongols have left and there's regional states, the Ming emperor, uh, Hong Wu, is going to try and bring everyone together under his imperial authority. There's a reestablishment of Confucianal education system for a few reasons. Number one, Confucius was Chinese, and he's bringing back a sense of Chinese culture to China after the Mongols kind of created a transnational or transregional uh, culture. They're trying to push out all instances of uh, Mongol influence. Also, by making a Confucian educational system, you're unifying people together under one ideal or one uh, way of thinking or ideology that unifies people together. Uh, execution of ministers suspected of treason begins a tra tradition of direct rule by emperor. Uh, this is a change where instead of having uh, ministers who are uh, operating on behalf of the emperor, you now have direct rule of the emperor uh, speaking about laws and running the affairs of his country from his position as emperor. Uh, reliance on emissaries called mandarins. So up to this point, we had ministers who kind of ran the day-to-day -day operations, but now we have emissaries who work on behalf of the emperor, and these people are called mandarins who go out and speak on behalf of the emperor, saying, uh, Emperor Hongwu has declared, blah, 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 and now your village needs to do this, or now you need to pay taxes, or whatever. There was a heavily heavy reliance on eunuchs. Really, a uh, eunuch is someone who does not have the ability to uh, reproduce, a eunuch is someone who has been forcibly sterilized uh, as a man. They have had their parts removed. Uh, they were sterile, so they could not build a hereditary power base. The biggest threat to a lot of regional uh, kingdoms or even imperial systems is that eventually someone could come along and create a power base with strong uh, sons or strong cousins or strong groups of people who would be able to unify their clans or their groups around them and then be able to attack or uh, try and overthrow governments. By having the eunuchs sterile, they couldn't build up power bases to eventually uh, pass it on. So let's say you decide to overthrow the government and you are successful and you overthrow Emperor Hongwu. Well, with that, if you were a eunuch, 
it wouldn't really matter because once you die, it's just going to result in massive chaos. So the idea was that you wouldn't be able to pass it on to your son or your family, and there was no line of succession. Centralized structure lasts through the Qing Dynasty to 1911, very far forward. Economic recovery, conscripted labor to repair and rebuild irrigation systems in China. Many of the irrigation systems for agriculture had fallen into disrepair under the Mongols. And uh, conscripted labor is forced labor. Basically, again, those mandarins would show up to your village and say, uh, on behalf of Emperor Hongwu, I have come here to tell you that every family in the village needs to volunteer one uh, person to go and work on rebuilding uh, the irrigation systems for your region. It was beneficial for you because you'd have more water to water your crops. It was also beneficial because the government didn't have to pay anybody and you could get a lot done through forced labor. Promoted manufacturing of porcelain and silk, which led to a cultural revival. There was an attempt to eradicate Mongol legacy by promoting traditional Chinese culture. Roll back to the Confucian teachings, roll back to uh, the way speaking in Chinese, roll back to tr Chinese systems of dress and food and other such things. Specifically, Emperor Yongle commissions a 23,000 roll encyclopedia. Today, it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of like one good sized book. And it accumulated all the knowledge of Chinese culture into this 23,000 roll encyclopedia. Originally, they planned on distributing it uh, out, but it became too cost prohibitive. But it's a kind of a marvel because at this point, they're trying to codify, or at least write down, in one section, all the things that make China Chinese. Recovery in Western Europe, they're state building. So we've moved now past the bubonic plague, past uh, the Little Ice Age. In China, we've seen centralized empire. In Europe, we still have regional states. But as these regional states are coming into contact with each other, we see Europe developing new taxes to build up large armies to protect their mm, slowly dying regional kingdoms. For example, the Italian states introduced something new called bonds. And bonds were interesting because uh, today you can buy bonds and it's often offered, uh, uh, we live in California, there's bonds offered um, every so often to pay for certain things or, or improve school systems. The way a bond works is uh, the government will say, all right, we'd like to build a road or a highway somewhere. There's no road or highway there now. And we're willing to offer to people almost like an investment. Because we're the government and we're very large, we're not a company, we can have the ability to say, hey, we're going to ask you to give us $50. You give us $50, we will give you a bond. And that bond is a receipt that you gave us $50. In 10, 15 years, we will pay you back more than what you've given us. It's kind of like an investment. And as the government, it's good because we say, hey, we get to build the road, the people are happy. And 10, 15 years from now, we now have a new road where we can collect taxes or we can allow people to uh, facilitate growth within our economy. And then in 10, 15 years, we can pay back that money to the people. And we have made a lot of money based on collecting the money from before. Uh, so bonds are really good and they're still even used today. In France, they introduce a salt tax, food without salt, not very good. A sales tax, everything that's sold has a certain tax added to it. You probably are aware of it. Um especially in, I think, LA County, it's something like 9.7 something percent on every dollar. In England, there's a hearth tax. Think of it kind of like a um, property tax. If you had a hearth, most homes were one hearth home, so you had to pay a tax on having a hearth. So you had to pay a property tax. There was a head tax per person. You had to pay a tax for just people that you had in your family, and a plow tax for as many plows as you owned. You had lots of plows, you had lots of land, you could afford it, so they wanted these taxes. The idea was to collect the taxes and then establish large standing armies to be able to protect the regions that they lived in. For example, the French Louis XI had an army of 15,000 as a result of some of his salt and sales tax. Spain. We're going to move over to Spain. Fr Fernando of Aragon marries Isabel of Castile in 1469. It was a major political and economic alliance for Spain as it signaled the end of the Reconquista. The Muslims had been pushed out by this point, uh, and Spain had become pretty much Catholic by this sen sense, expanded beyond the Iberian Peninsula all the way to Italy through this process, and they eventually will fund Columbus's quest for China. The Spanish are looking around at their European neighbors, are looking especially at Italy and going, wow, they're making lots of money over there. And yeah, that bubonic plague thing was weird, but what we really want to do is make sure we have lots of money for our new growing uh, empire that we're building up here in Spain. 
the Renaissance from the 14th to 16th century. We're going to pause on the growth and we're going to look at some cultural stuff. If you look back and you think about our study of world history, and go back to chapter one, and it was the first peoples walking out of Africa and spreading around the world. And then we fast forward through classical civilizations and some of the early civilizations, and then we get to my favorite one, which is Rome. And Romans pretty much borrowed heavily um, from Greek culture, which we would call Greco-Roman culture. It's kind of a blend. And they really focused on a few things that made them stand out and made them awesome. If you remember back, it was logic and reason and uh, philosophy and art and architecture and the human body and uh, a sense of writing and sophistication. And they were really focused on a lot of uh, what we call today the Greco-Roman styles or Greco-Roman beliefs. Well, after that, what ended up happening, if you remember, Europe fell apart. Europe fell apart because the Western Roman Empire fell apart because of the invasions by different barbarian groups and different uh, outsider groups. As e that happened, uh, Europe descended into what we would call the Dark Ages. As Europe descended into the Dark Ages, a number of things were lost. The Roman roads went into disrepair, Roman science, Roman logic, Roman architecture, Roman and Greek uh, art, Roman and Greek uh, society pretty much disappeared because many people were illiterate or were unable to really remember why things were the way they were under the Romans and the Greeks. And after that centralized imperial authority from Rome dissolved into regional kingdoms that we talked about a few chapters ago, people really stopped paying attention. However, many of the Christian monks and many of the uh, kind of in intellectuals of the time who had taught themselves to read and light, write Latin and Greek, they started to find through this cross-cultural process that there were a number of books written by uh, the Romans and Greek philosophers, Roman and Greek poets, Roman and Greek whatevers, talking about science and art and architecture and literature and everything. And as they went to these libraries and through this cross-cultural exchange, they started to say, oh, hey, Muslim guy, we're going to talk about the natural world and science. Hey, what book is that? Or what scroll do you have? What? That's a book from Plato. Let me see that thing. And they start to read it and they go, we don't have this in our library. The monks lost this one. And then they start uh, copying it and transferring it over to stuff that they could read it in. And at the same time, many Muslims were uh, receiving uh, information from other monks from Europe. And as this process happened, many people sat down, especially intellectuals who were able to read many of these scrolls or older books and tomes, and said, wow, look at how awesome the Greeks and Romans were. We need to return to that time, and we need to rebirth that classical culture. Renaissance means rebirth. And what they really focus on is trying to capture what they saw as like the peak of human existence they romanticized it or made it uh, kind of uh, looking back in a, in a fond way. If you remember back to maybe your favorite class when you were a little kid and you think about all the fun you had, maybe it was finger painting, maybe it was nap time, that was my favorite, and you kind of go, man, those were the days. That is romanticism and that is what they did to the Greek and Roman culture. Italian artists start to look at specifically uh, it. Greek and Roman styles of art, and they introduced something new called perspective. Now, many Greeks and Romans had understood this concept, but it had been lost as a result of the Dark Ages or uh, the Middle Ages, right? And the Italian artists start to say, oh, let's, let's paint this way, and let's paint uh, with different angles, and let's try and create kind of a depth of field and create take something that's 2D painted and try and add three dimensions to it by adding perspective. At the same time, there was a re uh, a reinvestigation into the way the human anatomy and musculature worked. If you think about a classical Greek or Roman statue, it might be uh, Augustus standing there with his left hand up and pointing to the sky. His features on there are very, very, very human-like, and he almost seems like uh, like he's been standing there, but he's in a giant like marble sheet, right? Uh, but after the Romans and the Greeks fell as a result, well, specifically the Roman Empire fell as a result of the invasions, uh, many people lost kind of an understanding of how to create uh, work that way. And by this rebirth or rediscovery during this time, many uh, people look around and say, oh, we know how to like 
draw like muscles on statues and or uh, on paintings and we know how to carve muscles and we're going to look at the human body as being uh, kind of awesome. Up to this point, many Christian uh, monks and many of the medieval thinkers were saying that the human body was evil, it was fallen, it was sinful, and the only redeeming quality to it was that Jesus had died for your sins, and if you believe in Jesus, then he will save you of your sins, and this this bad, gross body will die, and when you go to heaven, you'll get a new one, and that's going to be good, but don't don't worry about this body down here. It's gross, and it's, it can get plague, and get warts, and you can break bones, and it's bad. But during this time, the Renaissance painters and the Renaissance thinkers were saying, no, the human body is awesome. The Greeks and Romans thought the human body was the best thing ever. And especially someone like Leonardo da Vinci, the he's called the Renaissance man. He had a number of things that were uh, interesting about him. He was a philosopher and a designer and an architect and a engineer and a inventor. He was really into domed cathedrals. If you think about Roman architecture, it was huge, right? The col the temples, the Colosseum, a lot of uh, the things that were built, the, the Roman Forum were using columns, and domed cathedrals were something that weren't able to be produced because they lost the information on how it exactly worked. Well, as a result of some of this new findings in information, Leonardo da Vinci begins to create uh, domed cathedrals and helps other uh, Renaissance uh, architects to create uh, domed cathedrals in Rome and uh, all over the world. It's imitating the original Roman domes that were a part of the Roman Empire. Well, at the same time, there's a group that are going to be really closely as associated with the Renaissance thinkers known as the humanists. Now, they're focused not on the human body, but on the humanity, specifically literature, history, moral philosophy. Renaissance humanists are deeply devoted to Christianity. They believe that Christianity is an amazing thing, Jesus is good, and that's, that's great. But one of the things they start to look around and say is, yeah, the version of Christianity that we're able to read, because we're one of the few people that we can read, is, isn't really matching what we read in the Bible. What we see is a bunch of uh, monks going off to monasteries and making beer and not talking for months. And we see nuns who like wear like giant black and white like robes and wander around and just garden. And they pretty much hide in the mountains or in the forests and they don't really talk to anybody and no one visits them and they do their own thing. When we read the Bible, it sounds like Jesus kind of wandered around with a bunch of people. He went to Jerusalem, which was like a major city for its time. Uh, the disciples that follow Jesus eventually move all over the world, and we're really kind of confused on that. And so we want to reevaluate where did all these ideas come from? And they start with the literature and they say, well, the medieval thinkers or the people that are thinking about like the world, they're not really writing very good stuff. It's very like fancy and over the top and moody. And we're really focused on just day-to-day -day life. The Romans wrote a lot about day-to-day -day life. We picked up some of their scrolls and books and stuff, and we're saying, hey, those are cool. Like, they talk about, like, marriage and divorce, and they talk about, like, fighting people, and they talk about, like, rooting for their favorite team at the uh, at some of the sporting events that they had. They talked about gladiators stabbing each other. It's really interesting. We should focus on some of that stuff. They also look back at history, and they think that... Uh, the way that the medieval monks were writing history is super strange. They start to have this really big focus on God's hand throughout all of history, and there's only one real history, and they're saying, no, nah, we met some Muslim guys. They're starting to tell us some other stories about history and how other things are happening. Maybe we need to reevaluate history. And then at the same time, they're saying, yeah, the monks are really big into this specific type of philosophy. Like, they're really big into, uh, you know, that the only thing God loves is you being alone and in the middle of the woods and praying 24-7. And it doesn't seem like the Greeks and the Romans, especially the Roman Christians, like the early ones were really focused on that. It seems like they, they prayed and stuff, but they were really way more into like being a part of society and that, that being ascetic and out in the middle of nowhere isn't really what Christianity is about. And so the, someone like uh, Decidius Erasmus publishes a, class, a critical Greek Latin edition of the New Testament. He says, hey, maybe we need to make like a New Testament, but it's kind of like unified and we're going to make sure it's Greek and Latin. And we're going to kind of look around and say like, hey, let's have more people read it because if we can just teach people Latin, that's cool. And then they'll read it and they'll understand what Christianity is about because there's nothing in there about like monks in, in monasteries. And if you're Greek, that's cool too. 
He also devoted uh, to dis- rediscovering classical Latin, Latin texts, often ignored in monastic libraries. At the same time, these uh, humanists were going around. They're going to these monasteries saying, hey, um, monk guys, do you have a library full of stuff? And they go, yeah. And they go, can we look at it? And as they go in there, they say, what, what are all these scrolls? They go, oh, a bunch of Latin stuff from the Romans that were left here by like the barbarians from a long time ago. And they say, why haven't you been reading these? Why haven't you been trying to figure this out? And they said, oh, we just read the Bible. Remember, God wants us to like pray all the time and focus on that. And so many of the humans say, no, ugh, all this information has been just hidden away here. We need to read them. We need to translate them. We need to figure out what they were saying. And this is how we start to find a lot of the things that were lost during the medieval ages. Humanist moral thought. Really, like I said before, it was a rejection of monastic lifestyle in favor of the morally virtuous life while engaged in the world. Many of the humanists saw the monks as being strange for wanting to hide away and not being a part of society. Uh, Much of the Bible talks about people who were very much engaged in society. They weren't living in monasteries alone on a mountainside. Many of them are fighting in battles, especially in the Old Testament. Many of them are kings, and some of them are... uh, prophets talking to people and interacting with people and living in society, the the book of Acts, which talks about the Acts of the Apostles after Jesus uh, dies and rises again. They talk about how they wandered around from town to town and like talked to people and tried to tell them about Jesus. And they said that, especially the humanists said, we need to do that. That makes way more sense because this other stuff doesn't sound like what the Bible's saying. And especially in the area of marriage and business. Many monks, all monks, especially during this time, were not married because they saw that they had a duty to follow Jesus wholeheartedly under the those who fight, those who work, those who pray. Their job was, you know, praying all the time. Well, in the Bible, it doesn't really say that you're not supposed to get married. What it says is that if you can't prevent yourself from burning with lust, Paul talks about how it's better you should get married than to just sit there and be upset that you're like, oh, I need to get married. Oh. Uh, and so a lot of the humanists say, oh, you can be a Christian and get married. That's awesome. And, uh, they also say business. Many of the monks didn't really engage in any type of business because they thought that money was some sort of like, it would make them unclean through the process of like, you know, trying to grow wealth and they had taken vows of poverty. But many of the humanists said, yeah, it doesn't really say that either. It says we need to use our money well. We need to be uh, charitable to people, but it doesn't say there's nothing wrong. It doesn't say there's anything wrong with having a business. It just says you need to be a good Christian with your money. And the humanists start to reconcile Christianity with rapidly changing European society and economy. The humanists are looking around saying the monk system is not working. The monastery system, the ascetic lifestyle, this is not helping as we are looking around the world and we're interacting more through trade. We're interacting more to seeing other perspectives on the world. And we're really looking back to what the Romans and Greeks saw. And they're saying that we're doing it 100% wrong. And so many people are starting to change the way they look at interacting even within Christian society of Europe. Renaissance Europe and the larger world. Artists express interest in Byzantine and Asian worlds. Uh, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, uh, 1463 to 1494, tries to reconcile Plato, Aristotle, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Zoroastrianism. We've talked about some of these people before. They're really big into trying to make everybody get along, especially in uh, philosophy and religion. The problem is Giovanni Pico della Mirandola uh, is a failure at this process couple reasons. Number one, he doesn't really understand a lot of what he's trying to reconcile. And so when he tries to explain it to people, they're not the people who follow a lot of those uh, philosophies or religions are saying, yeah, that's that's not what we're saying, man. And he also is a failure because he was unable to really kind of he oversimplified too much of their beliefs. All of them have in common something like you should be a good person. Well, what does that mean? Especially to Plato versus Islam, that, those are very different things. Christianity to Judaism, mm, very different things. Aristotle to Zoroastrianism, very different things. Being a good person to all of them kind of looks different. Yeah, there's some unifying things like don't kill people, but sometimes it's okay to kill people in one, two, three, all six of those groups. So yeah, not good. Exploration and colonization. The Ming Dynasty was hesitant to have large foreign populations. First of all, they remember back to the Mongols, and they really don't like the Mongols and how they came in, took over China because they allowed them to stay, so they're not really big on foreign populations showing up. They allowed small populations to stay in port cities because, again, trade. Trade's super important. This will come back to China again and again as we go 
uh, forward into the next few centuries. Uh, Yongle, uh, Emperor Yongle engaged Admiral Zheng He to mount seven massive naval expeditions between 1405 and 1433. Uh, Muslim eunuch Zheng He uh, was told by the Emperor Yongle, hey, go out in the world, go see what there's out there to trade, make us look awesome, go show the world what China is about. Uh, they placed trade under imperial control through this process. Emperor Yongle says, we are going to control the trade. Yeah, there are traders, but the government's going to be in charge of who gets a trade and why and yada yada. Uh, demonstrated the strength of the Ming Dynasty everywhere Zheng He went. He showed off how awesome it was uh, with all his boats that were super giant and had lots of stuff in it. It was su super successful as he traveled all over the world. Problem was uh, twofold. Number one... The Chinese emperor was saying, yeah, that's cool what's out there, but really we need to focus like back at home on agriculture, so I don't really want to spend a bunch of money on this anymore, and told Zheng He to come home after his seven voyages, and they just let the boats sit in dock, and they eventually rotted, and most Chinese didn't even know Zheng He had done what he had done until a few centuries later. Also, uh, many of the Chinese thing, many of what the Chinese saw coming back, especially in the imperial court, they thought of as, meh, not that big a deal. Not something that really they should be spending that much money for what they're getting. Uh, if you've ever gotten something where you go, oh, I'm going to spend this much money, and I'm going to get this thing, and it's super cool, and eventually you get it, and you go, yeah, that wasn't worth the money I spent on it. That's kind of what they're looking at with Zheng Han, his, uh, his uh, travels. Here's a map of Zheng He, Bartolomeo Diaz, Vasco da Gama, and Columbus. These are the last few people we're going to talk about. Uh, down at the bottom... On the right, you're going to see Green Arrow, and it's coming out of China. Zheng He travels all over Southeast Asia. He eventually goes to India. He eventually makes it all the way to Mecca and to Eastern Africa in Mogadishu and kind of comes back to China. And uh, many people go, eh, not that big a deal. European exploration in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Uh, originally, the motives for Europeans to spread out are uh, a few. First, they want some profit. They are starting to see that trade is becoming a very... A quickly growing part of economies in Europe, and they say uh, most European countries say we want to be a part of that process, whether it's through ocean trade or through land trade. But we really want to make sure we're part of the game, or we're going to get left behind. At the same time, uh, many of the European countries were uh, Catholic or Protestant, which we'll talk about very soon. Uh, they were really uh, focused on growing their. Uh, participants in their religion. And so they were willing to send out missionaries to go out and spread the good news specifically of Christianity. Portuguese are the early leaders in Atlantic exploration. If I go back really quick, click, uh, kind of right in the center, right in Europe where it says Lisbon, Seville, Granada, uh, that's the Iberian Peninsula. On the right hand side in very large section is Spain. On the kind of where Seville is, very narrow part, that's Portugal. If you were Portugal, there's a few things preventing you from being a part of the European Eurasia trading network. Number one, you are a very small country on the very western part of Eurasia. To be a part of any trade networks, you're going to have to do a few things you don't want to do. Number one, you're going to have to either participate in the Mediterranean uh, trade networks, which are pretty much dominated by the uh, Italians, and they're going to levy heavy duties and taxes on you as you try to trade. Not profitable. If you want to go over land, you're going to have to go through uh, your neighbor Spain. And uh, Spain really didn't want uh, Portugal to be successful because that would lead to rivalries and eventual violence, and so Spain wasn't allowing a very favorable trade uh, process out of Portugal into mainland Europe. So if you're Portugal, you're going to start to look out and go, hmm, we do have the ocean, and if we can go from the ocean and maybe make it all the way to India, and we can do it productively and efficiently, we can make lots of money without having to involve anyone else, and we can make we can cut out people who are trying to take advantage of us. So uh, Portuguese explorers end up searching for a sea route to the Indian Ocean base, and they had heard a number of things about the Indian Ocean trade networks, and they're saying, okay, we're going to go join that. Prince Henrique, Henry the Navigator, seizes the Strait of Gibraltar in 1415. That's the space between like the southern tip of Spain and northern Africa. And it, it begins the encouragement of major Atlantic voyages. He sees, okay, now that we control kind of the in and out of the Mediterranean basin, or Mediterranean Sea, 
were able to kind of go out and see what else there is. And they know that Africa is south of them and they're willing to go and see what's happening in Africa. Colonization of the Atlantic Islands. But before they get to Africa, they take over the Madeiras and the Azores Island. Uh, those two were uninhabited. They eventually try to take the Canary Islands, but they're unsuccessful as there are already people there. They invest in sugarcane plantations because, again, Europeans are looking around saying, hey, sugar's kind of awesome. Let's have some sugar. And they want to be part of that trade because that's something that's uh, they're able to be super efficient in producing and trading and moving into Europe. They eventually explore West African coast and find a lot of people living there, specifically Africans, who uh, already are doing agriculture and, and a number of other things uh, down in Africa. This dramatically increases the volume of slave trade. Many of the Europeans that eventually land there, specifically the Portuguese at the beginning, uh, take many of the natives captive and use them for slavery. Uh, ultimately, some 12 million Africans will be deported to the Americas for slave labor after Columbus discovers the Americas and the uh, triangle trade network, which we'll talk about soon, gets set up. Indian Ocean trade. In an attempt to avoid using Mus Muslim middlemen in trade with the East, uh, many of the Portuguese explorers decide that they're going to leave from Portugal and try and make it around Africa all the way to India. They had a rough outline of what the world looked like. 1488, Bartolomeo Diaz sails around the Cape of Good Hope, which is the very, very bottom part of uh, South Africa. 1497 to 1499, Vasco da Gama sails this route to India and makes it all the way back. Portuguese gunships, because of gunpowder, uh, attempt to maintain trade monopoly. If you were Portuguese, what you decided to do is go, hmm, we've got this whole trade route set up, but once the Europeans find out that we're doing this, they're going to all try and jump on our trade route. So we need to use that new gunpowder stuff that's been invented or shown to us. We're going to use the guns on our boats and we're going to shoot anybody who tries to you know, move in on our territory. Uh, this is the beginnings of European imperialism in Asia. We're going to see Europeans show up in Asia and kind of believe that they run the place and that they should have a better treatment as they go throughout time. We'll keep revisiting this. Christopher Columbus, a uh, famous guy. You probably have heard of him before. 1492, sails the ocean blue. Uh, originally, he wanted to search for a western sea route to the Indian Ocean. Christopher Columbus and almost everybody at that time who was educated knew the earth was round. He did not believe the earth was flat. He did not believe he would fall off the earth. What he was looking for was if you go the other direction, specifically west, could you eventually make it to the eastern side of the globe? At this time, Many Europeans, however, did not know about the Americas. I would say 100% of people did not know about the Americas in Europe. They believed the Earth was pretty much Eurasia and Africa. And if you say uh, Christopher Columbus was uh, a very small, him and a small number of other uh, explorers and sailors believed the Earth was way smaller than it actually is. And all you have to do is if you head west, you'll just go around the backside of Earth and end up in like China. And then you'll eventually move from China to India and then you'll be all set. And that'll cut down on time going around Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope. So the Portuguese consider his proposal impractical because they say it's too far. It's too um, unable to really make a lot of money going that direction. So they reject it. So Christopher Columbus thinks for a bit and goes, I know. I will find a new group of people to support me and sponsor me. And so I will go to Ferdinando and Isabel of Spain to underwrite the voyage. And he leaves in 1492. Heads west, eventually finds land. He makes landfall in San Salvador in the Bahamas, in the Caribbean part of the Americas. He believed he reached the islands off the coast of Asia. And so he said, awesome, I've made it all the way to India. And many of the natives said, nope, don't know what you're talking about, man. And uh, Christopher Columbus, uh, many say to his dying day, really did believe he made it all the way there. He was kind of a horrible person. If you kind of read up on him, he took slaves uh, by force to try and impress and continue his exploration uh, reset, uh, money income. He also was uh, really into trying to find like other sources of income, like gold, and so he enslaved many of the population into doing mining and uh, farming through plantation farming, through violent means. Uh, and eventually we're going to le learn about the Colombian Exchange, which leads to one of the largest uh, disease introductions to a population in the history of the world that results in a very large number of deaths. So we've made it to the end. When you've finished studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Identify and discuss important long distance post-classical trade patterns and routes. We started that, we talked about it, What that was like the first slide. Next, explain the reasons behind an increase in post-classical political, religious, and diplomatic travel. 
what were some of the reasons they wanted to wander around and why were they political, religious, diplomatic? What were they doing? What were the Europeans and the other uh, Eurasians doing traveling around? Next, discuss the roles of missionary campaigns, long distance travel, and cross cultural exchanges. What was the outcome of all those people interacting with each other and uh, what changed as a result of it? Next, explain the presence and spread of pandemics across the era. Uh, there's one. I think we talked about two in this chapter, so you should be able to find that. Next, explain the rise of the Ming Dynasty in China. How it happened, why it happened, what were some of the things they did to kind of consolidate power. Next, discuss and identify state building recovery efforts in Europe. After the Little Ice Age, after the bubonic plague, what changed? What were some of the major movements? Outline, oh, next, outline some key elements of the Renaissance in Europe. I did that for a while. Make sure you can do that too. Last, compare and contrast the Ming and European exploration efforts. That's very key. This is a compare and contrast thing. That's something the AP uh, College Board test people love to talk about all the time is compare and contrast is a historical thinking skill, key idea thing. Uh, so make sure you understand how the Ming and European explorers kind of differed in their approaches and, and their ways of doing things and how they did it. All right. Writing assignment, by a short uh, response, five days, blah, 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 blah. number one, try to imagine the impact of a catastrophe such as the bubonic plague on European society. How did people behave? What was the impact on social relations? Consider this. How would you behave in such a crisis? Would you live your life any differently? Number two, what are some of the common elements in the process of European state building? What specific measures did the national monarchies take in order to establish and maintain their authority? Who do they need to control? And number three, what were some of the common concerns of the Renaissance humanists? How would these goals be expressed today? Does the word humanism mean the same thing today as it did then? No, you need to make sure you explain how it's different. Alrighty, so we made it to the end. It's time to reread your book. Uh, thanks for staying with me. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.